Today, we delve into the captivating saga of Frederick, Prince of Wales, a figure shrouded in the complexities of royal drama and familial strife. From his tumultuous relationship with his parents to the unexpected twists that marked his life, Frederick's story unfolds like a gripping historical novel. Instead of ascending to the throne as king, Frederick, Prince of Wales, ended up fathering one of history's most infamous mad monarchs, George III. Yet, Frederick's narrative goes beyond this unfortunate beginning. From his astounding feud with his parents to his shocking and abrupt demise, he bequeathed a deeply unsettling legacy. Born in 1707 in Hanover, Germany, Frederick wasn't always in close proximity to the English throne. His parents, George of Hanover and Caroline of Ansbach, only assumed the titles of Prince and Princess of Wales when Frederick was seven, and that too, thanks to convoluted family connections and a stroke of luck. Nevertheless, Frederick and his family were now part of British royalty. Unfortunately, this spelled disaster for the ill-fated prince. As the Prince and Princess of Wales, Frederick's parents had royal responsibilities in England. In a remarkably callous move, they left Frederick in the care of an uncle, without a clear time frame for their reunion while bringing two of his siblings with them. The consequences of this decision would prove to be unimaginable and have a lasting impact on Frederick's life. Even in his formative years spent away from his parents, Frederick felt their influence, sometimes in disconcerting ways. His mother, Caroline, a sharp woman with a scientific mind, readily enrolled him in the brand new smallpox vaccine trial, despite limited understanding of its effects at the time. While she was right about the benefits of vaccines, it was alarming how willing she was to expose Frederick to potential harm, an act he didn't appreciate as he grew older. In 1727, a pivotal event unfolded in Frederick's life. In June of that year, his father ascended to the throne as King George II, making Frederick the Prince of Wales. Now a robust 20-year-old, Frederick could finally cross the border into England and fulfill his duties to what essentially felt like a foreign country. What should have been a heartwarming family reunion turned into a shocking revelation for Frederick's parents. During his time away, Frederick underwent significant, not all positive, transformations. Raised by indifferent private tutors, he arrived in England burdened with substantial debt from gambling and a proclivity for numerous mistresses. The new king and queen of England were taken aback, realizing their wayward son had more disappointments in store. Upon his return to England, Frederick dealt a crushing blow to his parents. Holding a deep-seated grudge against them after years of separation, he wasted no time in establishing his own rival court, comprised of his parents' political adversaries. However, he was playing a dangerous and divisive game that would have far-reaching consequences. Enduring 14 years of parental abandonment provided Frederick with ample reason to harbour resentment. However, it also meant that he wasn't fully acquainted with the cunning nature of his mother, an adept stateswoman experienced in handling adversaries. In response to her eldest son's rebellion, she redirected her favour towards Prince William, exploring ways to disinherit Frederick in favour of his younger brother. Though her efforts were unsuccessful, she had more strategic moves up her sleeve. Despite Caroline and George's failure to completely disinherit their son, which ultimately proved unnecessary, they devised a means to curtail his rise to power. In a reflection of the misogynistic times, whenever King George was absent, it was Caroline, not Frederick, who acted as regent, an overt snub that stung deeply. Frederick's subsequent actions underscored the need for parental guidance. As Frederick immersed himself in court life, troubling behaviours emerged, notably his questionable judgment in companionship. He formed a close alliance with Lord John Hervey, a notorious court gossip and provocateur. The association hinted at Frederick's questionable virtues, and together they ventured into a colossal mistake. Beyond the realm of messy drama, Frederick displayed a passion for the arts and music. Collaborating with Hervey, he ventured into theatrical comedy, 
staging a play on Drury Lane in 1731 under the pseudonym Captain Bodkin. The result was a genuine catastrophe, evident from the unfortunate choice of pen name. A lesson in privilege, wealth does not guarantee artistic prowess. Frederick and Hervey's artistic endeavour proved so dismal that Drury Lane's manager anticipated its failure on the opening night, royal patronage notwithstanding. So confident was he in this prediction that he took extreme measures. Cognizant of his reputation, the manager stationed soldiers in the audience on the night of Frederick's play to maintain order when the audience inevitably realised the extent of its failure. The prediction came to pass. The play flopped, the soldiers maintained control, and disgruntled attendees received refunds. However, Frederick's taste for scandal persisted. Amidst the chaos, Frederick found fresh ways to vex his parents. Shortly after arriving in England, he scandalously declared to his mother that he was taking one of her ladies-in-waiting, Anne Vane, as his official mistress. In Anne Vane, Frederick encountered a formidable match. Anne Vane hailed from a lineage of audacious women, with her own mother being a notorious figure at court. Embracing this legacy, Vane had numerous lovers, and Frederick was just one in a list of many. However, her presence in Frederick's court soon stirred more than just gossip. In the 1730s, Frederick confronted a significant revelation. Anne Vane was pregnant. Yet, the identity of the father remained a mystery with multiple contenders, including Frederick and Lord Harrington. Regardless, Vane gave birth in the prestigious St. James's Palace, signalling a continuing connection with Frederick. But Vane had more calculated moves in store. Exhibiting a masterful approach to being a mistress, Vane named her newborn son Fitz Frederick, meaning son of Frederick. When uncertain about the paternity, why not choose the most powerful figure as the father? However, Vane's cunning manoeuvres were about to instigate a fresh rift in Frederick's life. Anne Vane's lover roster included Frederick's close friend Lord Hervey, the court gossip. While they managed a complex relationship for a time, the birth of Fitz Frederick seemed to alter the dynamics. Hervey asserted that Fitz Frederick was his son, leading to a falling out between him and Frederick. Yet this wasn't the only upheaval on Frederick's horizon. Despite the ongoing tumultuous relationship with his parents, urgent matters pushed Frederick to align with them in the mid-1730s. As the heir to the British throne, Frederick needed to marry promptly and produce legitimate heirs, a matter that escalated into a farcical situation as is customary in the House of Hanover. Marrying off the supposed next King of England should have been straightforward. However, Frederick's journey to matrimony became a debacle, largely due to his impatience. Initially negotiating with the King of Prussia for his daughter's hand, Frederick grew weary of the prolonged process. In a rash move, he sent his own envoy to Prussia, infuriating King George and sabotaging the entire arrangement. Well done, Frederick. But then again, his motives for marriage weren't entirely noble. Beyond romantic ideals, Frederick sought a substantial dowry in a bride. Given his extravagant lifestyle and mounting gambling debts, he eyed Lady Diana Spencer, one of England's wealthiest women. Unfortunately, the government and his parents disagreed, leaving Frederick back at square one. What followed was a particularly heartless turn of events. By the age of 29 in 1736, Frederick, exhausted from seeking a new source of income or a bride, yielded to his parents' suggestion of Princess Augusta of Saxe-Gotha, a 16-year-old German princess with limited worldly experience. Frederick reluctantly agreed to marry whomever his parents chose, provided she brought sufficient wealth into the marriage. It wasn't a fairy tale beginning, and things were destined to take a darker turn. Augusta, arriving in England without knowledge of the English language, found herself isolated with limited avenues of support beyond her interactions with the German royal family. To compound matters, her wedding to Frederick occurred almost instantly in May of 1736, leaving her ill-prepared for what Frederick had in store for her. In her initial months in England, Frederick's young bride engaged in a pitiable display. 
The teenager, so young and naive, was often observed through palace windows playing with dolls. It was not a poised image for the new Princess of Wales, prompting Frederick's sister to intervene, convincing Augusta to set aside the toys and cease embarrassing them all. Frederick's counsel, however, proved despicable. During this period, Frederick ended his association with his former mistress, Anne Vane, and became involved with Lady Archibald Hamilton. Regrettably, Frederick discovered that marriage to Augusta hindered his freedom to see Lady Hamilton as he pleased. Compounded by true rumours circulating the palace, Frederick devised a diabolical plan to navigate these challenges. In an egregiously manipulative move, Frederick exploited his new bride's naivety to address his mistress situation. He vehemently denied the rumours about Lady Hamilton and convinced Augusta to appoint her as a lady-in-waiting. This manoeuvre granted him unrestricted access to his unquestionably illicit affair away from prying eyes, a betrayal that surpassed even his most subtle deceptions. Despite the forceful nature of Frederick's mother, Queen Caroline, who wore the proverbial pants in her relationship with the king, Frederick intentionally maintained distance from Augusta throughout their marriage. He vowed never to confide in his consort, opting to do everything contrary to his parents. However, this aloofness didn't prevent him from making a sinister request of her. Contrary to his parents' expectations, marriage did not pacify Frederick. Instead, it unleashed his darker tendencies. Recognizing Augusta as a potential pawn in his schemes, he instructed her to actively snub his parents, thrusting her into the front line of his petty family feud. The resulting fallout was nothing short of absurd. Frederick's inventive methods of insulting his parents knew no bounds. At one juncture, he insisted that Augusta always arrive at the chapel after Queen Caroline. While seemingly minor, this directive required the meek Augusta to rudely push past Caroline each time to reach her seat. When Caroline caught on and directed Augusta to use a different entrance, Frederick countered by instructing his wife to refuse to enter the chapel entirely if Caroline arrived before her. The audacity of his actions knew no bounds. Persistently seeking money from his parents, Frederick engaged in almost incessant quarrels with his father, even with the additional coin brought in by Augusta as her dowry. Despite this, it was never enough, and heated confrontations ensued, with Frederick demanding a larger allowance from Parliament for his vices. The dysfunctional relationship between parents and son continued to escalate. Despite Augusta's naivety, she quickly grasped the intricacies of married life, becoming pregnant with her and Frederick's first child by 1737. Rather than a joyous occasion at the palace, it triggered the most intense feud yet. Learning of Augusta's pregnancy, Queen Caroline insisted on being present at the birth, insinuating potential illegitimacy and the need for royal supervision. Frederick, however, wasn't about to accept this quietly, leading to an almost unbelievable reaction. In July of 1737, Augusta went into labour. Shockingly, the moment Frederick learned of this, he compelled her to hastily board a carriage and endure a gruelling hour-and-a-half journey while in labour to the remote St. James's Palace. His determination? To thwart his mother's insistence on being present at the birth. The situation quickly unravelled from there. Upon arriving at the palace, Frederick and Augusta startled the skeletal crew of servants, utterly unprepared for guests, let alone a childbirth. No suitable bed or sheets were available, forcing Augusta to give birth to a baby girl, little Princess Augusta, on a tablecloth. The ordeal, however, was far from over. Queen Caroline, with her extensive network of informants, swiftly learned of her son's actions. Rushing to St. James's with an entourage that included Frederick's former best friend, Lord Hervey, she made sure to berate the new parents upon arrival. Reportedly, the Queen expressed her delight at the birth of a poor, ugly little she-mouse, asserting that nobody would attempt to pass off an illegitimate girl as a legitimate heir. If there was ever a beginning to Frederick's relationship with his parents, this marked the apparent end. 
Post the birth of Frederick's daughter, Queen Caroline practically disowned her son and held nothing but contempt for her daughter-in-law. Recognizing that Augusta's actions were directed by Frederick, Caroline disdainfully remarked, Poor creature, were she to spit in my face, I should only pity her for being under such a fool's direction and wipe it off. Her harshest criticisms, however, were reserved for her son. The animosity between Frederick and Caroline reached unprecedented levels, culminating in one of the cruelest insults on record. Lord Hervey recounted an instance where Caroline, upon seeing Frederick, exclaimed, Look, there he goes, that wretch, that villain. I wish the ground would open this moment and sink the monster to the lowest hole in hell. This venomous statement, delivered by the Queen of England and his own mother, painted a stark picture of the familial discord. Yet, Frederick had more provocations in store, particularly aimed at his father. During this period, support for Frederick's parents dwindled, especially with his father frequently leaving the country and his mother assuming more regent duties. A satirical notice appeared on a royal residence, criticizing George. Lost or strayed out of this house, a man who has left a wife and six children. For Frederick, this likely brought a sense of petty satisfaction, and he was poised to capitalize on it further. In late 1736, as Frederick's father rushed back from Hanover to pacify his subjects, a calamity unfolded. The king's ship encountered a storm, sparking fears of his demise. Rather than feeling any semblance of grief, Frederick saw this as a cunning opportunity to further his agenda. Despite King George II surviving the ordeal, Frederick seized the chance to sow discord. In early 1737, as the king was recuperating, Frederick spread a false rumour that the king was genuinely on his deathbed. The court, relying on Frederick's authority, fell into a panicked state, forcing the ailing king to prove his vitality by attending a public event. The court, assuming Frederick's information was reliable, plunged into chaos, King George, compelled to dispel the false rumours, dragged himself out of bed to attend a social event. Frederick likely revelled in the chaos he had orchestrated. However, as Shakespeare warns, these delights can have violent ends, and Frederick was about to experience it firsthand. With the family conflict reaching a boiling point, Frederick's parents delivered the final blow in the latter half of 1737. They banished Frederick, Augusta and their child from the royal court. The Prince and Princess of Wales relocated to Leicester House, distancing themselves from the monarchy's core. Little did they know, it would be the concluding chapter in the lifelong family feud, because time was running out for both Frederick and his mother. Shortly after Frederick's move to Leicester House, tragedy befell the royal family. Queen Caroline fell gravely ill Diagnosed with a strangulated bowel, a fatal condition at that time, and a harrowing way to meet one's end. For days, the Queen endured excruciating pain, awaiting the inevitable. When Frederick received the news, even he was shattered by the sorrow that engulfed the royal household. Despite a lifetime of disdain for his parents' troubles, the impending doom of his mother proved too much for Frederick. Moved by a desire to mend relations, he approached his father, seeking permission to see the Queen and possibly make amends. The response he received was heart-wrenching. King George, with Caroline's approval, denied Frederick entry to her rooms. Nevertheless, she conveyed a message to him. The exact sentiments Caroline harbored for her wayward son in her final hours remain unknown, but she sent a message to Frederick through a politician, expressing her forgiveness. However, the nature of this communication could be interpreted as a masterstroke of passive aggression, potentially marking Caroline's triumph in their feud. Queen Caroline's passing on November 20th, 1737, deeply affected King George II and the entire palace. A month later, her funeral took place in Westminster Abbey, and notably absent from the guest list, possibly following Caroline's wishes, was her eldest son, Frederick. A striking exclusion, indeed. Despite this, the remaining years of Frederick's life took an unexpected turn. Whether influenced by the passing of his mother or not, 
Frederick underwent a notable transformation for the next decade or so, becoming a model citizen, or at least not a thorn in the crown's side. He settled somewhat into life at Leicester House, and he and Augusta went on to have nine children together, including the future King George III. Surprising developments unfolded during this period. In the 1740s, a remarkable event occurred. Frederick and his father experienced a reconciliation. Although largely driven by political expediency, the Jacobite rebellion triggering a near succession crisis in Scotland, it resulted in warmer relations, with Frederick and Augusta becoming regulars at court functions once again. Yet, as with his mother Caroline, any reconciliations proved too little and too late. In March 1751, at the age of 44, Frederick found himself in robust health, likely anticipating his eventual ascension to the throne. Adding to the positive outlook, his wife Augusta was expecting their ninth child. However, fate had a different script in mind. While at home in Leicester House, Frederick succumbed to a pulmonary embolism, bringing an abrupt end to his life and plunging the household into chaos. Augusta, Frederick's recently widowed wife at the age of 32, received the shocking news of his sudden demise. Despite enduring considerable hardship during their marriage, Augusta, as recounted by her doctor, struggled to accept the reality of Frederick's death. Her attendant spent hours attempting to convince her, highlighting the complex emotions surrounding the passing. In the aftermath of Frederick's death, his father, George II, delivered one last snub. Revealing that their reconciliation was largely a facade, George II mourned his son minimally and organized a modest funeral. This aligned with his long-standing desire to remove his least favored son from the line of succession. Nevertheless, Frederick's legacy endured through an unexpected source. Princess Augusta, having undergone significant personal growth since her marriage to Frederick, recognized the importance of securing King George II's favor for the future of her eldest son. Displaying remarkable charm, Augusta appealed to the monarch's goodwill, successfully obtaining the coveted regency position. This achievement, elusive for Frederick during his lifetime, played a crucial role in shaping his son into King George III. However, in hindsight, this development carried its own complications. Ultimately, Frederick's lineage bore one more stain, King George III, known as the Mad King George. Afflicted by either porphyria or, more likely, bipolar disorder, George III grappled with recurrent bouts of mania as an adult, exhibiting symptoms such as foaming at the mouth, incoherent speech, and instigating decades of instability in England. It stood as a legacy Frederick, in all likelihood, would not have desired. 